is being approximately 10 o'clock and we're we'll open the hearing on House Bill 1525 FM. Before we do that, I'm going to make an announcement that basically is between the union leader Sunday. It's going to be the same thing. you speak thing. up a little? You, you need to get for Ruby's hearing aids? I can't hear. I can't hear. Okay. Sorry. What, I'm saying, <laughs> what I'm saying is, this is going to be run as a standard committee. There will be no demonstrations, no outbursts, no, uh, no nothing to disrupt the hearing. Uh, anybody who does that will be uh, asked to leave because this is part of the people's house and it needs to be dealt with in a manner that meet civil, civilization and, uh, and the appropriate manner of talking. Having said that, I'm going to call uh, Representative Gallagher. Chairman Thal and the rest of the Pub Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Representative Brian Gallagher and I represent Belknap District 4, which comprises the towns of Sanberton and Tilton. I appreciate the opportunity today to present to you House Bill <coughs> 1525, an act relative to the circumstances that constitute indecent exposure and lewdness. Mr. Chairman, I initially would like to acknowledge that this bill has created or caused some uneasiness with membership. However, it is my goal today to present information initiated by constituents in my district who have an expressed concern on female toplessness resulting at the, Gulf, uh, the Guilford Town Beach, Hampton Beach, and the Weirs Beach. House Bill 1525, which I'm sure the committee has a copy in front of them, so I won't read it. Um, I want to make some critical points. There is a specific exemption in this bill where it does not apply to the active breastfeeding. There's been some confusion in the media, so I just want to put that out up front. The most important points to focus upon in examining this bill are public place, presence of another person, reckless disregard whether a reasonable person would be offended. That is the substance of the bill. This legislation is modeled after existing Arizona statute. The statute is law and it has been challenged in Arizona and the Arizona appellate courts have upheld the language in their jurisdictions. You may hear testimony here later today that New York ruled differently. New York's laws and wording are different. However, what we need to do is to pay very close attention to the proposed wording in House Bill 1525. Next, I'd like to address some arguments you may also hear today. One, regarding First Amendment, Amendment protection to free speech the prohibition offends the anti-discrimination laws of RSA 354A. Both of these issues have recently been decided by the 4th District Court Division in Laconia, presided over by Judge James Carroll. I will be leaving a copy with the committee today of the court order as a result of that case. What I'd like to do, though, is to highlight a very summary. On page four, the court finds that the demonstration on the beach in September of 2015 is not symbolic expression as protected by the First Amendment of the <coughs> Constitution and by the New Hampshire Constitution. The court does not find prohibition against females appearing topless as discrimination and is not a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. On page five of this court ruling, the court does not find the prohibition, in this instance, female toplessness, 
violates any constitutional protected right. Finally, on, also on page five, the court finds the township, Guilford in this case, has a compelling interest which is met in maintaining the beach as a natural resource to be enjoyed by young and old, men and women, families, single persons, while preserving a standard that allows the, town, the township to, main, the, to maintain their local values and mores. Now these important issues of law have been adjudicated, so one might ask, why do we need House Bill 1525? The third important component of the suit heard in, heard in Belknap County by the defendants argued that no state statute which prohibits the public display of the female nipple or breast, RSA 645 colon 1, indecent exposure and lewdness. The defendants were determined to be correct. The court went on to rule New Hampshire criminal code mandates that no conduct or admission constitutes an offense unless it is a crime or a violation under this code or under another statute. The court further went on to say that since there is no pro prohibition of state law which prohibits this expression, the court found that the township lacked authority for a criminal prosecution which is neither provided for in criminal code or by statute or enabling legislation. Thus, House Bill 1525 is before you to address the important question for New Hampshire on what direction we as a state want to go moving forward on this issue. To allow public toplessness or not in public. There are moms and dads who live in New Hampshire with young children as well as grandparents and grandchildren who struggle with this public conduct in evolutionary, evolutionary challenge to family values. I submit to you these folks are entitled to the same rights to enjoy public space as others. It's a shame that some folks are more concerned with exposing their breasts in public places then they are concerned with how families and children may be impacted by being forced to experience this evolving societal behavior. Some, e some individuals are very eager to assert their rights, but so relu reluctant to accept their responsibilities. A lack of respect for others, I believe, eats away at our society. I ask you, as a committee, to stand up for the freedoms of New Hampshire families and citizens to live in a public society free of forced normalizing behavior in the 21st century. By presenting this bill, the discussion is now in the open. For New Hampshire to decide whether or not to promote this topless behavior in public spaces or not. This simple yet very complex question needs to be examined and answered by this committee and your decision will determine where the public policy goes. You may have a difference of opinion from what is being presented so far. You most likely will hear that female topless set, toplessness at the beach is not a big deal and since men can go bare chested on a beach, why can't women? Simply answered, it is an indisputable fact that men and women are physically different. And this goes back a ways to the beginning of time. Do you not know that your body is a temple? Also, <clears throat> if the purpose was what, if the purpose was this limited scope to only beaches, quite frankly, it may have some merit. But the larger picture shows it is not intended to be limited. This is only the beginning. Like almost all changes in society, they start small, 
sometimes unnoticed, and then before being recognized for what they truly are, they have grown into a trend that has become the new accepted public behavior. This is where I caution the committee to not only look at the now, but look forward to where this could lead us in the unintended consequences it may create. To help look forward, I would suggest that the committee, through your researcher, consider visiting the website breastsarehealthy.wordpress.com. This website belongs to a person who is in favor of this movement. This website answers that future question very clearly. I had the opportunity in December of 2015 to meet for an hour and a half with a nice person, Ms. Chelsea Covington, in the State House cafeteria to discuss this bill and to try and understand her, poison, her opposing viewpoint. It was a very respectful and cooperative discussion. We simply agreed to disagree. Her website shows public documentation of toplessness behavior at public locations where other citizens, including children, are present, which goes beyond the public beach locations suggested as the only places for toplessness in New Hampshire. For example, what you will find is toplessness at the Rock Creek Bicycle Path in Washington, D.C., in front of the U.S. Capitol Building in Washington, D.C., at the National Mall before the Smithsonian Building, public space in York Beach, Maine, hiking trails in the Green Mountains of Vermont, Scully Kill River Biking Trail, Philadelphia, Washington Memorial Monument in Washington, D.C., Georgetown University College Campus, Prescott Park in Brooklyn, New York, playing Frisbee, St. Jones River, Dover, Delaware, behind the state capitol. I think I've made the point. House Bill 1525 focuses upon the public spaces and behavior the state wants to choose to condone as, as being acceptable in these shared spaces. I would also suggest that the committee consider visiting the DREAD State Resource and Economic Development website on tourism and promotions. There you will find the following quote. New Hampshire enjoys four seasons, all of which are a dynamic backdrop to endless recreational opportunities on all our lakes, along our seacoast, and throughout the mountains. This is what markets and promotes our important New Hampshire tourism. This committee, of course, is aware of the general fund dollars that help to support so many critical services in New Hampshire. These dollars are generated from tourists both within and from outside the state who enjoy our family-friendly atmosphere described in the state website. With constant financial pressures to adequately fund critical services in New Hampshire, I submit we want to be very careful not to create unintended consequences which will cause a decrease in tourism activity, thus affecting <coughs> important revenues for the New Hampshire General Fund. I want you to consider the following. If toplessness is deemed an acceptable public behavior, what would prevent it from being acceptable at these public places? Public schools on a warm September or May day. Public libraries where our seniors gather and children are there for reading hours. How about at the elementary Little League game or the soccer games? 
Public county fairs, they're popular venues. How about the UNH alumni football game in the fall? Certainly many more places that we could consider public. Why not, I ask, why not? Ladies and gentlemen, this is not about a proposed expansion of simple nudity or, or female toplessness at a beach like Hampton, Weirs, or Guilford Town Beach. This is about a movement to change the values of New Hampshire society. Please recognize what it is and the likely consequences if we as legislators fail to act. Mr. Chairman, I will pause to allow others to present information to you on this House bill proposal on indecent exposure and lewdness. I simply ask that after you review, after hearing testimony from others, and after careful deliberations on this difficult topic, that the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee recommend House Bill 1525-FN enact relative to the circumstances that constitute indecent exposure and lewdness as ought to pass to the full House for consideration in the 2016 session. I conclude with this thought. Everyone is in favor of free speech. Hardly a day passes without it being extolled. But some people's idea of it is that they are free to say what they like, but if anyone else says anything back, that's an outrage. Winston S. Churchill. Freedom is one thing, respect is another. Once again, Mr. Chairman and the full committee, thank you for the opportunity to present some remarks this morning. Thank you. Uh, would you give the clerk your, your notes? That would make his life a lot easier. Absolutely. And I can email two if you would like. Uh, any questions? Representative Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative, for introducing this bill. But uh, as I see it, society has already shot itself in the foot in this age of uh, conflict, gender bending. Uh, how do you deal with a uh, a male identifying as a female or a female identifying as a male without uh, opening up a whole Pandora's box of unintended consequences trying to regulate it. <clears throat> Thank you, Representative Martin, for, for the question. Um, I certainly wouldn't uh, uh, sit here today and say that uh, I'm an expert on, you know, uh, an answer like that or a question like that, but, but I can offer you some information um, on how I think about it and maybe how we can address it. Um, as I said earlier in my talk, men and women are physically different. Our politically correct <coughs> thinking has obliviated discussion and it's blurred the lines of common sense. Women can have babies. Men cannot. Men have testosterone, women have estrogen. I'm not aware of a men's group that's lobbying and protesting for male breastfeeding. Just think about our memories. Men ha women have the enhanced ability to recall memories that have strong emotional components. Men, to, men tend to recall events using strategies that rely on restructuring of events. We're all created in the same image and likeness of God differently to complement one another, one another. As our society evolves and tests the limits of what gender is and what a man and a woman is, um, that's something that we all experience. So, I don't have, a, I don't have a, a clear solution to your question, Representative. I simply point out that history and tradition has shown that there's enough precedent for common sense, practicality to begin to reemerge in our society today. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
um, on line, uh, I think it's the first page, line seven, it, it starts off with exposes. Um, is it just the nipple that is not allowed, but in here it says breast or breast in public, you know, her breast or breast in public. I guess I'm, you know, wondering, I see some ladies and of course being a male, um, as you pointed out, we are different, I will definitely look, uh, that have cleavage. Is that breast? So would they be violating this law if they have a very large cleavage that they were showing <clears throat> without showing the nipple? Thank you, Representative Burke. Um, the, the clear intent of the bill is to address the situations that were a result of the demonstrations this past summer where a selective group of women chose to disrobe their entire top. Um, it's not the intent that a person who dresses in a manner where some of their body is shown um, would be in violation of this law. It, it, it does go to the heart of drawing a line on what will be acceptable and what will be unacceptable in the public space. Toplessness, by its clear nature, I believe describes that situation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You realize that up until the 40s, bikinis, two-piece suits were illegal. It was illegal for a lady to show her belly button. Would you go back to that? Thank you, Representative Robinson. Uh, a little bit before my time. Um, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not looking to go back to that time. What I'm trying to do as a result of concerns from constituents, and I'm sure you have constituents that are concerned about other issues in your area. I'm concerned about this specific topic that's before us here in 2016 about female toplessness in the public space. That's, that's where I'm focused. Thank you very much. I see no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Horrigan. Oh, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Representative Falls. I guess I'm going to disagree. I'm Representative Timothy Horrigan from Stafford County District 6, which is the towns of Durham and Madbury. Um, that's actually near Portsmouth, where Prescott Park is. Um, is located. So I'm not sure whether Representative Gallagher meant that there had been a demonstration in Prescott part of Portsmouth or perhaps Prospect part in, uh, in Brooklyn and also the school, whatever the school pill part in Philadelphia, he's got, it's not the Scully Hill part, but that's a minor point. So I basically um, totally, totally disagree with pretty much everything I just heard, except perhaps men and women are different, but um, um, it's this bill is unnecessary because all public acts of gross lewdness are already forbidden, regardless of which body parts, if any, are exposed. Um, the language about breasts is discriminatory because it only deals with women's breasts and nipples, as has already been pointed out. Men have breasts and nipples, and if you still pass the law, they can show them off all they want. Um, and that is just as well since male toplessness is commonplace in American society, even in pretty conservative quarters. Um, female toplessness is much less commonplace, but I, I don't think that doesn't mean it should be illegal. You know, definitely, um, just because Representative Gallagher is offended by it doesn't mean that it uh, needs to be made illegal. It, um, it harms no one, and in some quarters it is perfectly acceptable, as I think has already been uh, admitted already. Um, I think the language of a reckless disregard for whether a reasonable person would be offended or alarmed by such an act theoretically renders the proposed law unenforceable. I believe that I think <coughs> no reasonable person could ever be offended or alarmed by anything as normal and harmless as a breast or a nipple. Um, and finally, section two, which is pointed out, which carves out an exemption for breastfeeding, which is a reasonable idea. The way 
The bill as written it applies to not just to the proposed new subparagraph RSA 645-1, Roman numeral 1, um, parenthesis B, close parenthesis. It applies to the RSA of RSA 645-1, which includes some. Um, just about anything would become legal if you work, any act would become legal if you work breastfeeding into the performance somehow, including um, the rather extreme activity forbidden in RSA 645-1, um, Roman numeral two. Um, because of this bill, um, as, I mean, the committee knows much better than I do because they're, they're the experts on it. Um, it originally started with just subparagraph one, which is just about regular indecent exposure, and then there's um, subparagraph two has been added over the years, and that type of act is just a misdemeanor, and then subparagraph two is a class B felony, basically for sexual contact with, with uh, sexual exposure to children, which is a much more serious crime than simply ordinary indecent exposure. Um, certainly, that would be the ultimate and unintended consequences if the conduct covered by you know, paragraph Roman numeral two suddenly becomes legal just if you can claim that there was breastfeeding involved somehow, which would, um, I find that, even I find that pretty hard to imagine. So I think this bill is um, discriminatory, it's unnecessary. I think the conduct which was deplored by Representative Gallagher um, should continue to be legal. There's not that much of it. I know, for example, I'm a season ticket to UNH uh, football games. The, the existing, um, under existing law, I've never seen any female toplessness at the football games. I mean, I wouldn't be particularly offended or alarmed by it. I mean, I might think it was a dumb thing to do, but I've never, never seen any there, um, never even, Seen any at, um, never even seen any at the New Hampshire Motor Speedway races, even though there are dumb men who like are frequently calling on their uh, female fellow fans to uh, expose themselves. So that's, um, I think this is a uh, just a very bad bill. Attacks a non-existing problem. It, it attacks uh, conduct which, although may be controversial, shouldn't be illegal. So I, I urge the committee to uh, find a bill in each to legislate. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Representative Gallagher, uh, part of his testimony focused in on, um, you know, the start change starting small and then expanding into parks and all that stuff. And, and, and you just mentioned that you've never seen in a general uh, basis elsewhere. Um, in Europe, where, where such uh, activity is, is fairly commonplace at the beaches um, and has been for for decades. Uh, are you aware of any uh, expansion of that into city parks or anything like that? I mean, I think uh, people in Europe, I haven't been there myself in a number of years, but I certainly have friends who visit there. Um, there's um, people behave pretty well in Europe most of the time, just like they do in America. So I think it's, uh, and I really, uh, so I think the, the uh, <coughs> Toplessness on the beaches, I think, is not a problem in Europe. It, um, it's not very common here. It would be kind of scandalous if you did it on the beaches, but I don't think it would be a problem if people started doing it on the beaches here in New Hampshire. I think um, you know, that's not a that's not a societal evolution that I'm particularly offended or alarmed by if it does come to pass. And certainly in Europe, people people behave pretty much the same as they do here in the United States, which means most of the time pretty well. And of course, uh, of course, uh, something. Something here in the United States, which is commonplace, which isn't commonplace in Europe, is uh, exposing your firearms in public, but this bill doesn't deal with that at all. But you have other bills with it. So, uh, I'm more offended and alarmed by the guys who stand, say, I'm loud in the road, showing off their, uh, unnecessarily showing off their rifles, than I would be by women uh, showing off their breasts. Um, so. Right. Anyway, things, are, things seem to be fine in Europe, as far as I know. <laughs> I see no questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Peter Spanos. I represent District 3 in Laconia, and I'm a co-sponsor of this bill. This bill came about as a result of complaints from constituents uh, in the Lakes region. The majority of these constituents were offended. They had young families, and they felt that this was what they saw last summer, based on the complaints, was indecent and some prurient. I do want to say to the committee, thank you, that I'm 55 years old. Uh, I ran a saloon for 32 years. Uh, I am not a prude. Believe me when I say I've seen it all. But I think what we've been seeing for the better part of this young century is an erosion of standards. <clears throat> And to allow 
topless sunbathing when it is generally frowned upon, I think creates a precedent that could lead to more. I think that this bill deserves a fair hearing and should pass and go before the House uh, because I think we need the opportunity to decide what direction we're going in. Uh, Representative Robertson did raise an interesting point, and I was unaware of it. Uh, he mentioned that back in the 1940s, a two-piece bathing suit was perceived to be illegal. I don't know of that, but I'll take him at his word that it, that it is. We're certainly not looking to go into a time machine and roll back the clock here. I do believe that at this point a stand should be made, and we should attempt to address this issue now before we see a further erosion of behavior uh, that we consider to be improper. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for testimony. Uh, not to go into a, a time machine, but as a follow-up to Representative Robertson's question about the bikini, um, have, uh, has the exposure of, of male nipples on beaches always been legal? Do you know? To my knowledge, Representative, it's considered to be legal. I don't know what's on statute. And one of the questions that came up over the summer when we got a lot of feedback from our constituents in our area was what legal mechanisms for enforcement were on the books. As we all know, laws can be amorphous and difficult to enforce at times. And this bill does not really seek to muddy the waters. I believe the intent of this bill is to make it known that this could lead to offensive behavior that many of us don't want to see in a state that relies largely on tourism for economic input and income. Oh, oh. Um, my previous question was kind of rhetorical. I, I did want to inform you that since you didn't know about the bikini thing, prior to the 1930s, it was illegal for men to show nipples on, on beaches. I did not know that. But um, in, my, my question comes from, from, do you think that, based on what you just said, it sounds like you're thinking that, that exposure of breasts on a public beach can lead to other acts? Of, is, is, is that what you're, you're implying? My concern, and, and I do, it is a concern is that this can be a gateway to the type of behavior that we really don't want to see when we are painting ourselves as doing things as having the New Hampshire way, you know, being a clean, pristine state. Does it lead to streaking? I don't know. Does it does it lead to bottomless sunbathing? I don't know. But there is a time and a place for this. You know, I've, I've been to Europe. I've seen topless beaches. The Europeans do things their own way. You know, here in New Hampshire and in many of our states, we have a different perspective. We have different standards. We have different protocols. And there are many of us, I think, who would like to maintain these standards. Thank you. <coughs> Representative Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Chief. If you're concerned with taking off your bottoms, why don't you just make the law that you can't Take off your bottoms. Why are you going beyond it when the problem is that you're after is exposure of gender? Thank you for the question, Representative. I think the way I see it is that this particular issue came up in response to complaints on what transpired last summer in the Lakes region in our, in our lake beaches. And this bill is a direct response to women choosing to go topless and the local police who responded felt they didn't have a mechanism for enforcement. Uh, it, is, it is my concern and those who support this bill that once the genie's out of the bottle, we can't put it back in. If we don't make a stand now and establish certain standards, certain rules for what is acceptable in public bathing areas and what isn't, it will get beyond our control. And it could ultimately not only be detrimental to people's moral perspective, but I think more importantly, it could potentially have an impact on the state economically because of the tourist ramifications. I see no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Boulder. Thank 
the committee for hearing my testimony. Um, so I just want to say that I'm opposed to this bill, but not because I have any intention to expose myself. Um, I like wearing my clothes. New Hampshire's cold. Um, and even if the bill fails, I have no intention of exposing myself. Um, I'm not a member of the Free the Nipple movement, and I object to the bill because it violates Article 2 of the state constitution. Um, and uh, I suppose in my testimony, I want to tell you about my daughter. So she's nine and a half. And does anyone remember that book? Well, okay, there's this book that was called something like So-and-So's No Good, Very Bad, Horrible Day, right? And the book started out with him having gum in his hair. And that's how his horrible day started. That book really impacted me as a kid. And when I had my own kid, I wouldn't let her chew gum, ever. Her, her friends got to chew gum, but I wouldn't let her do it. Um, and by the time Sophia was five or six years old, I found out that she'd stolen gum from the pantry of a friend's parent. Um, so by prohibiting my daughter from chewing gum, uh, because I didn't want it in the carpet, I didn't want her to swallow it, I didn't want it in her hair, or stuck under desks or something, I turned her into a thief. <laughs> and as far as I know, it's the only time she's ever stolen. Um, so now I let her chew gum. <laughs> because I don't want her to be a thief. And uh, I'm wondering if anyone on the committee remembers in Keene a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago, there was a group of people who wanted to um, enact civil disobedience um, in, to, I guess, fight against the current marijuana, the laws against marijuana. So they smoked marijuana in public in uh, the middle of Keene. And they were occasionally arrested, dragged away, very dramatic, all of it on video, because they video everything that they do. Um, and the crowds just got bigger, and more and more people were showing up every day to smoke marijuana at 420 in Keene. Um, and then the police ignored them, and they stopped doing it. It took a while. They kept showing up day after day. But then they declared victory over having demilitarized the area, because they were no longer being har harassed as they said by the police. The point is, the police ignored them, and the activity pretty much went away. If the goal of this legislation is to prevent toplessness by females in public, I don't think that's what's going to happen. The people that demonstrated in public were, at the time, I suppose, fighting against what they see as cultural norms. But if you give them a law to fight, then I think that you're just going to encourage more and more toplessness in the form of civil disobedience. So again, if the goal of this legislation is to prevent toplessness, you're not going to accomplish that. Um, that's my opinion on this legislation, aside from it being a complete violation of the state constitution. Um, so thanks for letting me speak. Representative Robertson. You realize the skirt you're wearing used to be illegal in the state house in in any school high school or is it grammar too school? short it's too it short down to absolutely should i also wear something over my head i would not <laughs> think you're beautiful. My, face. my hands are showing i'm sorry thank you i see no further questions thank you very much thank you chelsea davis I'd like to thank you guys for your time. I am against this, uh, I'm for this passing. I just wanted to um, point out some things that had been asked by questions and maybe there wasn't good enough answers or um, maybe it hadn't been answered in an ideal way. Um, as far as gender identity goes, I have a friend I went to high school with and he is now she. He still has his parts, but she's she, and we all respect that. And being that she's now a female, she wants to be able to respect herself enough to cover up like a female would. So as far as gender identity goes, that's just my opinion on it. Um, and as to touch on what the lady that was just sitting here said, if you're gonna ignore things, if you're gonna ignore the heroin, heroin crisis, is it gonna go away? Human trafficking, is it going to go away if we ignore it? Dem uh, 
Domestic violence on women, is that gonna go away just because we're ignoring it? I don't think so. But my name's Chelsea Davis and I'm 20 years old. I am a resident of Tilton and I'm here to support House Bill 1525 FN before you today. So let us keep our shirts on, roll up our sleeves, and get to work on the proposal at hand. We need to pass this bill not so much for me, but for the children growing up today. I am here to speak to you uh, for them. I would like to think that we will be able to that we will be able to raise our children in a society that promotes a high standard of living. It seems to me that the moral fiber of our state and entire country is losing ground. It also seems to me you all have a great opportunity before you to, do, to stop that decline to some degree by supporting this proposal that would make it unlawful to expose the nipple in a public setting. I strongly believe that children are like mirrors. They reflect the attitudes in life. Anything you do, they're going to follow. We pass our ideals on to them. Can you honestly say that you would want to see your teenage daughter or your granddaughter, for that matter, sitting on the beach topless or walking down the boardwalk? Can you honestly say that you would be okay with seeing your teenage daughter or granddaughter at a sporting event, for that matter, in any public place? How would you feel if you saw your sister, your mother, or even your grandmother sitting there topless? Hard to visualize, but nonetheless, it could happen. As it stands today, there's no law against it. We, like everyone else had said before me, we do want to keep our state well as far as a tourist attraction. We get a lot of our revenue from that, and I think that's important to not make people run away because they have children or things like that. It's, you know, you don't want to bring your children to a beach and have them be like, Mom, why is she dressed like that? Like, why does she have no top on? We weren't raised like that. We learn to respect each other and have morals. It was brought to my attention recently by a supporter of Free the Nipple that one of their arguments in the movement was based on the fact from the Bible that Adam and Eve were naked in the Garden of Eden and therefore nudity is acceptable. I think maybe they should have read a little further. Scripture tells us that soon after they realized they were naked, they covered up. Why would primitive people do that? Out of respect? Maybe. Have we advanced so little that we cannot comprehend the need for privacy? Where is our respect for others? It can be shameful to have to, it is shameful to have to require a law to tell us to be properly clothed in mixed company. Respect for others should be enough. As a 20 year old, I have no desire to go topless. But the point is, I could if I wanted to. Thankfully, I was raised by, with high standards. I was taught at a young age to respect my body. Thank you, Mom. Common sense alone tells me that it's not good to bear breasts. <laughs> Why would anyone want to expose themselves to the damage from the sun when skin cancer is so prevalent in our age? Again, common sense should tell you to keep your shirt on. Growing up, my parents frequented various beaches throughout New Hampshire and Maine. Some of my happiest summer days were spent with my family on the beach. I met lots of people, boys, girls, old, young, big, small. And I have to tell you, not once did I ever see someone topless on the beach. I can only hope that the children growing up can have the same carefree time that I had at the beach without being exposed to more than they needed or wanted to see. For them, for their day at the beach, I would ask you to pass this law. It really is the right thing to do. It truly saddens me to think we must be ordered to be respectful to others when it should be a natural thing to do. Thank you for listening to me. I only ask that you will vote your conscience. Let's give the kids of tomorrow their special day at the beach. And I have, <coughs> I have a petition as well. Would you like it? <coughs> Who's that? Hi. Are you able to turn in your, your comments or do you need those? No, you can have them. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh,
Kate Fedra. several times because my former employer tried to force me to expose my breasts and so I have a federal lawsuit against them right now it's the state of New Hampshire who I'm suing um, but that is not what I meant to testify about thank you for your compassion I'm opposed to this bill House Bill 1525 may seem frivolous but it is as it is clearly unconstitutional to impose criminal charges upon only women and not men just as it may seem like a waste of time to the legislature to have a costly hearing on this unvetted bill when they could better spend their time addressing New Hampshire's drug crisis or health insurance matters. I think this committee has a chance, however, to make good use of this time to amend this bill if they don't kill it, to address a serious matter, that of sexual assault. I propose an amendment to this bill to ensure that any state legislator who criminally threatens to sexually assault women, whether they are breastfeeding or not, should be removed from office and held accountable to the New Hampshire judicial process. That's my whole statement. Thank you. Would you be willing to submit my, my card? Would you be willing to submit that, that document? I will email it to the entire committee and I would like to accept your card as well. Thank you. Thank you. I just got one small. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for your testimony. Do you know of any other law that says a man can do something and a woman can't, or a woman can do something and a woman can't? I think that's beyond my purview. I don't have a legal degree. I am self-studied. But right. I can get you an answer to that question. My attorney is the president of the New Hampshire Association for Social Justice. So I'd be happy to follow up with you about that. And just follow up. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, because when you said that you know this is going to be just for women, it, it, it just popped in my head. So I would love that information if you could. I would be happy to provide you with that. I'm just speaking off the cuff. Um, I don't think this bill is really about nipples or indecent exposure. My experience after reading this bill is that this bill is anti-woman. That's what this is about. And that's evidenced by the comments that were made that reached the national media. And I think that this committee has a chance to defend the New Hampshire legislature out of those comments and make use of this bill. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I forgot to mention that I'm the president of the New Hampshire Breastfeeding Rights Coalition. Um, and I realize that breastfeeding is exempted from this bill. However, I can tell you I did receive a complaint um, from a woman who was breastfeeding, um, unlatched from her nursling. Then somebody, a customer, complained about the exposure. She wasn't technically breastfeeding. Then the baby relatched. And management um, was able to hand that in a very proactive way and say, we encourage and support breastfeeding. You're welcome to leave if you are funded. And again, I realize breastfeeding is exempted, but the reason why I'm bringing it up is because if this bill passes, how is it going to address that situation? Um, and as far as the transgender issue goes, you know, I know cisgendered men, meaning men who identify as men and their bodies are biologically male. Um, who have larger breasts than I do. And I might be offended to see them naked on a beach, um, but that's their right. And it's also my right to feel offended. But I don't think it needs to be criminal or illegal. Thank you. Thank you. I see no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chris Cantwell. 
That would be me. Thank you for having me. Um, imagine that some of the people who oppose this bill, they think they'll be doing that uh, because they're very libertarian and seeking a, a freer world. I know a thing or two about the subject of libertarianism. I have a libertarian culture. I write for a living. And uh, I've come before this committee and a number of others, and I almost exclusively come in here to tell you to restrain or abolish some government power. Um, but I, I support this bill uh, for a number of reasons. The, the, uh, either, either the people who think that this is some kind of libertarian cause are uninformed or they have some kind of ulterior motive. Uh, and neither would surprise me and neither should it surprise you. Uh, libertarianism does not mean that you can do whatever you want. It means that you can do whatever you want with your own property. Uh, and you suffer the consequences of your own behavior if uh, that behavior pisses off your neighbors. Uh, public spaces are imposed upon us by governments. Uh, they are, people are compelled to pay for the maintenance of those spaces, whether they like it or not, and if they refuse to pay for it, they are threatened with imprisonment and death. I think that you are all familiar enough with how the tax code works. So whoever uses a public space, they do so at taxpayer expense. They are being subsidized by the government of the state of New Hampshire when they do things in a public space. So what is this government going to subsidize in its public spaces. Uh, you're basically left with a choice between subsidizing the healthy raising of children or to subsidize a radical far left feminist agenda which has been tried all over the country and all over the world with disastrous social and economic consequences. It was brought up before that they, uh, that they have uh, much more lax attitudes in Europe about nudity, for example. Well, I mean, anybody who wants to turn on CNN or Fox News and see what's going on in Europe it's not a good state of affairs over there. Uh, they've got a migration crisis, they've got a, a socialized healthcare system, they've got economic problems. This is what happens when a society begins to move in this direction. This has political implications. Uh, especially, uh, you know, I had originally moved to this state to find more freedom myself, okay? I'm from New York, we have a lot of restrictions, a lot of taxes, the guns, forget about it. Uh, and. I'm, I'm very concerned about things moving in a, in a leftward direction, all right? Uh, you have, with the, I, I had originally moved here with the Free State Project, I'm no longer involved with that organization, but they have been teaming up with left-wing lunatics from all over the place, and this is how they got themselves up to their 20,000 signers, and these people are all about to come here. And so when you have left-wing left radical feminists coming into this place, and trying to in, engage in these displays in order to push their agendas, those things are at odds with freedom and with property rights. And, it, and it's a thing that this, this body should really be very uh, afraid of. Men and women are not the same. And anybody who says that they are has an ulterior motive. You know, they say it's a, a misogyny to imply that there could possibly be differences between us. Uh, but, you know, I for one, and I imagine that all the men on this committee care very deeply for the women in our lives. Uh, and the, the people who say that we don't are, are the misinformed or dishonest. Uh, you know, the, the egalitarianism is getting to a point now that they're talking about register, make, causing women to uh, register for the selective service and throw them upon the gears of the war machine. And this is not something that I think is in the best interest of the women in our lives. It's not something that I want to happen to the women that I care about. I want the women in my life to uh, have healthy, prosperous lives and, and to be respected and not to be falling into these lunatic left-wing feminist agendas that are not conducive to a, a healthy lifestyle or a healthy uh, society. I want to protect women from equality. This body should act to protect women from equality because as most of the people on this uh, panel know, uh, being a man can be really difficult even for those of us who were built for it. And I'd be happy to take any questions. See no questions. Thank you. Good question. Yes. I saw you reading from a document. Would you be willing to submit that document? I'd, I'd be happy to email that to you, and I also wrote about this issue as well. I'll be happy to send you a link to that as well. Thank you. I got some things, but obviously. You know. Of course, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Jules Bissonnette. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have some written testimony as well that I'm happy to circulate as well as two court opinions. Thank 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Gilles Bissonnette. I'm the legal director for the American Civil Liberties Union of New Hampshire. The ACLU opposes this bill uh, and for, for three reasons. Um, the first is the ACLU has concerns uh, that this could uh, negatively, or I should say we have free speech concerns under the First Amendment in Part 1, Article 22 of the New Hampshire Constitution, uh, both of which protect speech, and that, of course, includes conduct designed to convey a particular message. Um, while nudity by itself may not be protected, some courts have held, and we think correctly, that expressive conduct using nudity can be protected when it intends to convey a message that is likely to be understood by those who view it. We actually cite one particular case from Florida, city of Daytona Beach, a case that's being circulated to the committee right now dealing with a quote, top freak protest, where the court there held that the speech there was protected because the toplessness was incidental to and necessary for the conveyance of the message that was being made by the protester. Um, and so uh, here, the concern is that HB 1525 creates uh, a free speech problem because it likely would criminalize women who are bearing their breasts to express various political messages. Uh, that others would understand based on the individual circumstance of that message. This, of course, would include potentially messages of protest against gender inequality in our society. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we of course understand and we've heard testimony today that some people are offended uh, by the rare occasion in which they're exposed to the female breast in public and in, in our concern is as part of speech. Um, but as the U.S. Supreme Court has explained, citizens must tolerate insulting and even outrageous speech in order to provide adequate breathing space for the freedoms protected by the First Amendment. So put another way, we believe that the price of living in a free society is that sometimes we may be exposed to speech that offends our sensibilities. And when this occurs, we think the proper response is to look away instead of banning speech that is believed to be offensive. We also think that HB 1525 is overbroad because it criminalizes female toplessness as a form of speech even when no one was actually harmed by the speech. So for example, the bill bans female toplessness, quote, in the presence of another person with reckless disregard for whether a reasonable person would be offended or alarmed by such act, end quote. So thus, under this bill, a crime is committed if a reasonable person would be offended or alarmed despite the fact that a person may not have actually been offended or alarmed. We think that's problematic and creates some overbreath concerns. Um, our second concern, while Judge Carroll may have disagreed with respect to the Guilford Ordinance that was in question in that case, we think that HB 1525 could create some equal protection concerns because it treats women differently from men. Um, of course, by allowing uh, men to bear their breasts while effectively prohibited women from doing so in most instances. Um, you know, we think, um, you know, that that's problematic. It seems that this bill is uh, tended to perpetuate <coughs> traditional gender roles, and we believe uh, and properly tells women what they should be able to do or not do uh, with their own bodies, especially in the context of <coughs> expression. Um, and finally, the third concern we have, and this, this may fall under the universe of unintended consequences, or may, may even attended consequences, but I just wanted to make the committee aware of it. Under the Sex Offender Registry, Section uh, RSA 651B18A, a Tier 1 sex offender is defined as one who committed a second or subsequent offense within a five-year period for indecent exposure or lewdness under RSA 654-1, which is what this bill amends. A Tier 1 offender must comply with the Sex Offender Registry obligations for a 10-year period from the date of release. Why am I saying that? Well, because by amending uh, RSA 654-1, which this bill does to include the exposure of a, bale, a, bare fem a bare female breast, this bill would not only criminalize protected speech, but would subject a woman to the, to the sex offender registry for 10 years who was convicted twice of this crime within a five year period. We think this is punitive and it would place uh, women on the registry who have simply engaged in speech and who are absolutely no danger to society and obviously have not committed a dangerous sex offense. 
Um, so those are three concerns with the bill, and I'm happy to take any questions. Representative Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, does the ACLU have any problem with towns imposing such ordinances on their town beaches? I think the concerns would probably be the same as the concerns we have under 1525, is that they, those bans could sweep within uh, their scope incidents where people are bare, women are burying their chest as a form of political expression, which does happen from time to time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is, uh, from ACLU's point of view, is this going to target a subset of women, which is childbearing age? So if they're in their early 20s, the age range, and within that 10-year frame, they're going to create a whole group of so-called criminal uh, criminals and prosecute them? So I think the, the concern that we have is we just wanted to make the committee aware that by amending this bill, you are expanding the reach of this statute, um, and by doing so, you would sub subject more individuals possibly to the sex offender registry. Um, and that would include, obviously, women who are engaging in, in this form of political expression, separate and apart from women who are doing it without any intent to con convey speech. And I just think that's something that we have concerns about. I think a, a woman twice within a five-year period engaging in this activity as a form of political expression isn't really a threat, certainly not a threat sufficient to, to warrant uh, sex offender registry status, which I know this committee is well aware of is quite onerous. Uh, follow-up, Mr. Chair. Follow -up. I was alluding to the mothers, young mothers, yeah. breastfeeding mothers, their unintended consequence of dragging them into the sex offender registry would be uh, unintended consequence. I, I do. Be? I'm sorry, Representative. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I think <coughs> I think this bill it carves out breast uh, breastfeeding, so it wouldn't technically sweep within its scope individual women who are exposing their breasts uh, to, to breastfeed. If I'm reading the bill correctly. Yeah. Representative Bird, do you have a quick question? Yes, I do a quick one. Uh, if I understand the news correctly, uh, the core said that they don't have a constitutional uh, right. Could you tell me where they were looking and where you're looking, saying that they possibly do? Sure. So, so uh, what Judge Carroll was looking at was the specific protest in question, and concluded that that wasn't that didn't uh, warrant First Amendment protection. Um, I respectfully disagree. Judge Carroll is an, is an amazing judge. I've been before him in the past. Um, and I would submit to the committee that a Florida court reached the exact opposite conclusion. Um, and so I, I think, uh, you know, when a woman is bearing her breast as a form of political expression and under the O'Brien test, which is the test we all use, uh, it's clear to a reasonable observer that the bearing of that breast is designed to communicate some sort of message, whether it's political or otherwise, that it warrants uh, First Amendment protection. I would note, uh, and I believe uh, counsel in that case is present here today, uh, but there has been a motion for reconsideration filed in that case, uh, fleshing out in greater detail um, the uh, First Amendment uh, uh, concerns raised by the Guilford mm -hmm. Ordinance um, and the O'Brien test and, and all the considerations I've just raised. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to point out that we have about 15 minutes left. I have 13 more people who wish to speak. I would ask the committee members and the member of, members of the public to uh, try to confine their questions and information to new items, not something that's already been discussed it's because of the fact that we have something to do at 12 o'clock. Can we give them copies of that paper? Yes. Yeah, 
Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Attorney Dan Hines, I represent the defense in the Guilford case. I'm very familiar with the judge's order in that. Um, as Julius has um, stated, I have filed a motion to reconsider, which is essentially a form of appeal with the court. The court did recognize that this statute gets strict scrutiny. That's the highest level we give a statute. At that point, it's pretty much presumed unconstitutional. I think one of the areas Judge Carroll erred in his decision is that he did not apply the least restrictive means test. That's required in strict scrutiny. And what least restrictive means it means is if, if there is another way to accomplish the same thing, you ha must choose that other way. I can, I can think of three things that would accomplish the goals here. One, you could prohibit children from visiting the beach. I suggest that would be stupid and you might not want to do that. But I think a town could do that if they could, wanted to. Another way that might alleviate some of the concern is to put a notice at the entrance of the beach. In the case of Guilford, the testimony of witnesses was that they were shocked when they saw this. If they're on notice, they might not be so shocked. Frankly, the first time I saw a presidential candidate with a boot on his head, I became shocked. As I saw him over and over again, I became less shocked. I actually ran into him last week without that boot, and that's what shocked me. I suggest shock is not a First Amendment exception. What we're dealing here with in the First Amendment here, a lot of people are saying it's annoying to them or it offends them. The Constitution protects offensive speech. You're allowed to burn your flag in this country. I suggest that's probably more offensive to most people in this room than some female nipples. You're allowed to say fuck the draft in a court in this country, and that's protected speech. And the court has said, if you have a problem with this, it's your duty to avert your eyes. We can't have a heckler's video, veto. If someone has a concern with this, I would suggest that you cannot take away the rights of the many for the right for someone who's potentially offended. I don't know who this person is that could be offended, but it's not up to the speaker to determine, hey, might you be offended by my conduct? That, that's not a First Amendment analysis. What we're essentially doing with this statute is you're criminalizing being a female. Let that sink in. In response to Redford's um, question of what other statute criminalizes a female, I can't think of any offhand, possibly some abortion statutes maybe, but other than that, no, no court would criminalize being a female. Um, in response to Representative Martin's previous question, um, in, in the case, we had the defendants testify and the prosecutor, well, one of the defendants, doesn't identify as a female, and she might be able to address that more. But when there's a sexual identity at issue, the prosecutor asked her, do you have a vagina? That is reprehensible for a prosecutor to be able to ask someone to prove how they identify, what sexual organs they have. That, that, I think that's just unacceptable for a court to get into. How can you prove whether someone's female? And people have noted or asked the, pointed out that there's physical differences. I don't know that there is a physical difference between a female nipple and a male nipple, but if so, why is the female nipple the bad one? That, that's essentially what happened. Um, as Representative Robertson pointed out years ago, men couldn't be topless at a beach, um, women couldn't be in bikinis, and that is the easiest solution to this problem. If people think that females should not be top of that beach, if you want to get around the equal protection violation, you make it against the law for everyone to be top of that beach. That would certainly survive the equal protection problem. Now, whether that would be a good policy argument, I guess I would leave that up to the legislature. But I guess those are the constitutional issues. I see a problem in this case, and that's why I oppose this bill. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes, thank you for taking my question. I am just curious to the fact of majority rules, okay? There's six women on the beach and a thousand other ones. And the thousand are against this. What do we do about that? Well, I think it's... It's simple that the First Amendment doesn't allow that distinction. If I like a candidate and I'm in the well minority, I can still support that candidate. I have the right to speak even if most people don't want to hear it. Um, I mean, that's essentially one of the things. Um, one of the things I also wanted to point out is the Arizona stat, I believe it was Arizona, that Representative Gallagher pointed out where this passed constitutional muster. I don't know that Arizona has the same state constitution New Hampshire has. Under Article Two, 
we're specifically protecting people based on gender. That's why under the state constitution, this statute is presumed illegal, unconstitutional, whereas under the federal constitution, it's a lesser standard. So I suggest it's unconstitutional under both, but certainly under the first. So to answer your question, again, I think that's a heckler's veto that I, the minority, can't have my speech censored just because I'm not in the majority. One day, if enough people do it, I would suggest more and more people are going to do it, and they'll eventually be in the majority. Follow up. Follow up. I'm just curious to what we do about our teenagers. Yeah. Well, if you're, are you saying that you want to protect the teenagers from seeing this, or? I, well, uh, were you a teenager? I wasn't. You know, I was sort of shocked that 12-year-old boys at the beach would be not wanting to see female press, I guess I would not be that way. So in regards to checking or protecting the teenagers, I think this, it can come down to the parents. I think the parents have to say, this is acceptable behavior. We can't be treating men differently than we treat women. I think that's the reprehensible conduct. Thank you. Thank you. I see no further questions. Thank you. Jeff Dean, do you have your testimony, sir? Um, yes, I also have copies in support of my motion to dismiss as well as my motion to reconsider <coughs> filed with the 20th District Court. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the committee. My name is Jeff Dean. I am speaking actually as a representative of Chelsea Covington, who uh, could not be here today, but sent me with some some um, comments to make. And uh, given that we didn't expect Representative Gallagher to cite her as much as he did in his opening, I will address a few of those things as well. Uh, as far as uh, Chelsea's website, which is called uh, Breasts Are Healthy, uh, it's a WordPress blog. Her uh, her blog is primarily aimed at showing the reaction of the public to legal female bare chestedness in public. Uh, so her, her videos and photographs show her walking through public places, bare chested, non-confrontationally, no slogans, no signs, no chanting, walking. And the videos and photographs show a public largely unaffected by this behavior. This is in very crowded places at times, yes and the legislative mall, uh, the national mall rather, in Washington, D.C., York, Maine, uh, Vermont, places in Vermont, New York. And the purpose of that website is to show that the perceived conceptual reaction and ter turmoil that would be created by a bare-chested female does not actually exist. So, yes, please do visit the website, please do view the images and videos, that is exactly why it exists, to show uh, a committee such as this uh, what would happen in reality rather than in concept. So adding something new, uh, I wanted to read uh, briefly from the language in a case called People vs. Santorelli, which was decided in 1992 by the second federal court. It is the case that enables the legality of female bare chestedness in the state of New York. So this is your neighboring um, uh, New Hampshire's District 1, of course, Federal District 1, and this is District 2. So in, in highlighting that, uh, what it reads is, and, and the language is so critical here, uh, that this is at the federal court challenging penal law, New York Penal Law 245-01 from 1992, which had criminalized the female nipple exposure, and the what their language said, the, uh, the, the illegal part of the breast was part of the breast below the areola. Seven women in Rochester, New York went bare chested as a protest and it eventually worked its way to the federal court which overruled the, the charges against them and, and wrote thusly. When a statute ex explicitly establishes a classification based on gender as penal law 24501 unquestionably does, the state has the burden of showing that the classification is substantially related to the achievement of an important governmental objective. It is clear from the statute's legislative history that the governmental objective to be served by Penal Law 24501 is to protect the sensibilities of those who wish to use public beaches and parks in this state. And since the statute prohibits the public exposure of female, but not male breasts, 
it betrays an underlying legislative assumption that the sight of a female's uncovered breast in a public place is offensive to the average person in a way that the sight of a male's uncovered breast is not. It is this assumption that lies at the root of the statute's constitutional problem. Although protecting public sensibilities is generally a legitimate goal for legislation, it is a tenuous basis for justifying a legislative classification that is based on gender, race, or any other grouping that is associated with a history of social prejudice. Care must be taken in ascertaining whether the statutory objective itself reflects archaic and stereotypic notions. Indeed, the concept of, in quotes, public sensibility itself, when used in these contexts, may be nothing more than a reflection of commonly held preconceptions and biases. One of the most important purposes to be served by the Equal Protection Clause, referring to the 14th Amendment of the United States, is to ensure that public sensibilities grounded in prejudice and unexamined stereotypes do not become enshrined as part of the official policy of government. Thus, where public sensibilities constitute the justification let me read it. Thus, where public sensibilities constitute the justification for gender-based classification, the fundamental question is whether the particular, quote, sensibility to be protected is, in fact, a reflection of archaic prejudice or a manifestation of legitimate governmental objective. As an aside, we've heard several testimonies today referencing the traditional value, the old values, the old values that we want to protect. That's what this is referring to. So back to reading from the... Back to reading from the opinion. Viewed against these principles, the gender-based provisions of Penal Law 24501 cannot, on this record, withstand scrutiny. Defendant, um, defendants contend that, apart from entrenched cultural expectations, there is no objective reason why the exposure of female breasts should be considered any more offensive than the exposure of male counterparts. They offer proof from an anatomical standpoint <coughs> that female breast is no more or less a sexual organ than the male equivalent. And they further contend that to the extent that many in our society may regard the uncovered female breast with a prurient interest that it is not similarly aroused by the male equivalent, that perception cannot serve as a justification for differential treatment because it is itself a suspect cultural artifact rooted in centuries of prejudice and bias toward women. Indeed, there are many societies in other parts of the world and the United States where the exposure of female breasts on beaches and in recreational areas is commonplace and generally regarded as unremarkable. It is notable that other jurisdictions have taken the position that breasts are not private parts and that breast exposure is not indecent behavior, and 22 states in 1992 specifically confined their statutory public exposure pro prohibitions to uncovered genitalia only. In summary, there's nothing to justify a law that discriminates against women by prohibiting them from removing, the, removing their tops and exposing their bare breasts in public as men are routinely permitted to do the mere fact that the statute's aim is to protect public sensibility is not sufficient to satisfy the state's burden of showing an exceedingly persuasive justification for a classification that expressly discriminates on the basis of sex. There, so yes, as Dan pointed out, there's a significant constitutional issue. The solution to that issue would be, the only real solution to that issue would be to make it illegal for anyone to bear a chest on a beach. Um, and then my final comments that I've been that I've been writing. Um, there's a difference between so so Representative Gallagher, Gallagher said he, he he noticed he what he described was a situation in which people were promoting female bare chest in this in public. Not true. What the Top Freedom Movement is doing, as, and well, what Chelsea in particular is doing, and what the Top Freedom Movement is doing, is fighting for equal rights under the law, equal treatment under the law. I have never heard a Top Freedom Advocate tell another woman to go bare chested in public. What Top Freedom Advocates say is it should be a woman's choice, number one. Number two, evolution, Representative Gallagher represents evolution and actually rejects the idea of evolving social standards in this regard. Another <coughs> word for evolving is progress. Um, I'm for progress in social, social situations. And, and then, uh, actually, Representative Gallagher even said, if this was limited to beaches, this would have some merit. So it's not as bad as he, as he claims it is. So, um, yes. Uh, and then the last thing, the, the young woman sitting, sitting behind me uh, asked us to think about the, the consequences to our daughters, our sisters, our wives, implying that they are possessions. It is their choice to decide what they do with their bodies. It is their choice. Thank you. I see no questions. Thank you very much. Joseph Brown. 
Well, again, I'd like to remind people we only have now have 35 minutes. And what's going to happen at, at uh, 5 of 12, I'm going to be asking the people in the audience whether they want to come back after the next hearing or whether they want to be recorded in, in their position because we allotted two hours for this and the people that came in here on time were getting their cards in in, in, in a timely fashion. I've received probably five that have come in after the hearing started and I want to give the people who appear here on time a chance to be heard as soon as possible. Representative Toll, committee members. Um, we've heard a lot about this is for the children and this is about the children. I don't want my daughters and my son growing up in a state where they're told that they are different. They have physical differences, but the law should not treat them differently. The law should treat each of them with the same respect. Uh, we're told that other states have found this constitutional, and this was addressed before, but again, New Hampshire is different. We do things the New Hampshire way, not the Arizona way. We're also talking about respecting women. Well, I believe the best way to respect women is to let them make choices for themselves, not to tell them that we know better. I believe in the interest of time, that's probably all I need to say right now. Thank you very much. Any questions? Seeing none, once again, thank you very much. Is it Greg Goldberg? Yes. Sorry about my handwriting. Not a problem. The next one's worse. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, members of the committee. Uh, a lot has been made today about states and other countries that are more permissive than the United States and as we are here in New Hampshire. May I flip the coin, however, and illustrate the opposite idea that something like this Bill 1525 would drag us back towards. In much of the Middle East, a woman is her husband's property. She would not be allowed to drive. A female-bodied individual would not even be allowed out of the house without being covered head to toe. Moreover, that person would not be allowed to even address this committee, even if their views were germane to it. So I, I wonder what we do if, by only saying the parade of horribles on this side, do we miss the parade of even worse horribles coming up behind. Also, I, I know as much has been said and you're trying to limit your uh, repetition, much needs to be said about equality under the law. And if the law must remain equal, as the gentleman before me was very clear, if the law must remain equal, then the law must remain equal. And unless we are going to go to amend either the New Hampshire or even national constitution, such needs to remain the case. Otherwise, we should enact a law that says everyone must cover up at all times from head to toe. Thank you. Thank you. Someone has no questions. Thank you very much. Robert, and he's from Franconia. <laughs> <laughs> what is your last name? Hi, I'm Robert Owen Williams. Thank you for inviting me to speak here. I'm, I try to keep it brief for a lot. Um, I think that this uh, proposed bill uh, amendment is inexpedient to legislate and. I think some of the key things are there, there are two different things that we have going on. One is the societal norms and standards, the way that fashions change. And the other is the law, what is written in our criminal code. And I don't think that we want our criminal code to be addressing what the fashions are. Fashions are going to change much more quickly than laws. We in New Hampshire have a very good and very fair uh, public indecency statute. It's very clear. Men and women are treated equally under the law. And there's not really any doubt about intent. The, our current law is very clear when things are being indecent. 
And I think that's all, really all we need. Uh, it's, it's been pointed out, you know, there's a lot of change happening, and I think we should let the change happen without addressing it in the law. We should keep our law fair and balanced as it is. As to, I've heard some questions about where people may have seen toplessness. I have seen topless men and women starting at a very young age, from when I was a child to a teenager and on to my current life. And my reaction has been pretty much the same because of the way my family brought me up to treat men and women equally. It didn't bother me to see a topless man. It didn't bother me to see a topless woman. And that's really all I have to say that hasn't been said already. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak. I see no questions. Thank you very much. I'm sorry you had to make such a long drive. <laughs> that's okay. Mine's a little long. <laughs> Heidi Lilly. Thank you. At least you don't have to stand up in front of 400 people okay. to say something. <laughs> Thank you. I still bend the podium, believe me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for letting me talk today. No um, I'm testifying against this proposed bill today because I strongly feel that it's a solution that's looking to resolve a problem that does not exist. It simply is not a problem. Many of you have probably heard who I am, I'm Heidi Lilly, and I've um, been cited at Guilford Beach for toplessness. I spent a lot of my time over the last 20 years either topless or totally nude, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm talking about topless. Um, children are not affected by it. Teenagers, they're not affected by it. They, they go, oh, and walk away. Kids play on the beach. They don't speak. They don't say. They don't lift their heads. I sat at Weir's Beach this summer with a little boy in his, in his little boxer briefs and his diaper, bouncing a balloon back and forth with him on my lap. His, his adult, I assume it was his mom, was there and she was smiling and laughing. Kids don't take notice of this. They just go about their business. I heard mention of what about us going into public places like the library or the school. Well, one of the things that I hear often is that this leads to rape. Rape happens no matter what a person is wearing. It doesn't matter whether you're fully clothed or totally topless. Rape happens because of an inequality of power. This bill is just adding one more sense of inequality of power. When I was 11 years old, I was in a public building. I was in a public school. And I was raped by a public school official. I was fully clothed. I had never seen my teacher unclothed. He had never seen me unclothed until I was raped. I was raped again when I was 18. I was wearing a full-length flannel light dress. I had never seen that person unclothed. He had never seen me unclothed. Rape happens because of an inequality of power. Please do not take power and make it unequal. I guess in conclusion, I'd like to just say that if you do decide to vote on this bill in favor of this bill, that we go back to the 1930s when it was illegal for men to be topless and make it equal for both men and women. 
Thank you for your time. Heidi, is there a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Questions. Would you be interested in submitting your testimony to the record? This was want? just a uh, rough notes, but. If you like. Yeah, it's just rough notes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Andrew Gregori. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Andrew Gregoire, and I'm from Manchester. Uh, I speak to you today because, as a lover of liberty, I believe that all men and women should be should be. Uh, treated equally because they were created equally, and that uh, laws that discriminate based on gender are immoral. This is a belief shared by the overwhelming majority of the public, and we know this because in 1974, Article 2 of the New Hampshire Constitution was amended to include the statement, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by this state on account of race, creed, color, sex, or national origin. Uh, one of the things I heard Rep Representative Gallagher state uh, was that this was legislation that was modeled after legislation in Arizona. Uh, I did a quick Google search while I was sitting there waiting for my turn to speak, and I found that Arizona does not have these same constitutional protections that New Hampshire does. Um, so the way forward that I see, we have two choices. We could criminalize toplessness for all persons regardless of gender, or we could continue to leave the laws alone and allow toplessness for everybody. Uh, furthermore, under this bill, a second offense is a class B felony, punishable by up to seven years in state prison and would permanently strip a person of their natural rights of self-defense and right to vote. Does this seem like an appropriate punishment for removing one shirt? If you wish to restrict the constitutional rights of all women in New Hampshire, then this bill is for you. If you wish to waste hundreds of thousands of dollars in court litigation that the state will lose, then you should pass this bill. If you wish to embolden your political opponents in the September primary and November general elections, then you should vote for this bill. However, if you believe as I do in freedom and justice, that all persons are created equally, and that all persons should be treated by government equally, then I urge you to vote this bill inexpedient to legislate. Thank you. And I have some written testimony as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just give it to the clerk and be very happy. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. No, you had one over there, oh, Mr. Good. Barnes. Oh, Mr. Barnes, I'm sorry. <coughs> you didn't have his hand up long enough. Yeah, <laughs> not quick enough on the draw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. In my travels, I've come across a number of establishments that have signs on your entry door that say shirt and shoes required. Uh, do you have any problem with private establishments so posting uh, those restrictions in their uh, facilities? A absolutely not. That's, that's private property, and I think they should be able to set the rules for that. And I also think that has to do with public health as well, I think, if it's a food establishment. And, okay. and that applies to both genders, obviously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gary Stevens. Thank you. Would you quit? Not that I don't think it's sufficient. Respected members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me today. Right now in the state of New Hampshire, I have the right to be topless anywhere a man may legally be without a shirt. Since learning of this, I have exercised this right peacefully and respectfully on several occasions. I was happy to attend the awareness rally at Laconia at Lears Beach and was also at Guilford Beach when Heidi and Liz were sighted. I've often walked the one block from where I live to enjoy Hampton Beach as well over the last summer. All of these things were done topless. Many of my trips to my beach locally, I've been solo. I have not had one scary interaction by the blessings of whoever is keeping track of this stuff. I have not had one negative, aggressive response except for the day at Guilford. 
I go to Hampton Beach by myself. I go to the same spot on the beach every time. I don't make my presence obtrusive. I go to the beach like everybody else. The difference being, when I lay down to enjoy my sunshine, my top comes off. That may be shocking to some. Alarming, I don't understand. We all are humans, we are all adults. Hopefully we are teaching our children properly about personal space boundaries that shouldn't include clothing. To hit on something that Heidi pointed out, rape doesn't happen because of what you're wearing. It doesn't happen whether you have breasts or not. I was six years old when I was first perpetrated on. I didn't even have breasts yet. You cannot tell me that my breasts are inherently sexual and dangerous. To touch on something <clears throat> that Representative Gallagher said that I believe is incorrect, patently false. The physiological structures of the breast between male and female are exactly the same. I urge you, please look it up. The difference being the amount of adipose tissue and the useful structures of the mammary glands that we use to feed our children. Breasts are not dangerous to children. Breasts nourish children. Children don't care until we teach them that something is wrong or dirty or shameful. I am not ashamed of my body. I spent many years reprogramming my brain so that I no longer felt dirty, used, or worthless. The gender-specific language pertaining to a woman's breasts only is discriminatory and unconstitutional. My bare female breasts are no more or less indecent than a man's bare chest. Again, the physiological structures are exactly the same. Also, for those who oppose bare women's breasts for religious and moral reasons, I would point out, recently we as a country have engaged in combat half a world away where the government bases their restrictive Sharia law on similarly based religious and moral issues. How can you tell them that their discriminatory laws are unjust and worthy of reform and war, and then enact discriminatory laws yourself in your own perceived free country? If you are a parent opposed to female toplessness, I understand your fear, your daughters, and granddaughters may one day want to utilize this right. I would hope that your concern was more for their safety and not because, oh my God, it's sexualized. There is nothing inherently sexual about the human form. It is the perception and the filter through which we see it. I would also encourage those parents to instill those values in their children. I took umbrage at the fact earlier that my parents' raising of me was somehow lackadaisical or lax in moral or value. My parents raised me incredibly well, despite certain things. That's how I can sit here in front of you today and not be the radical loon that some people would like to have you believe we are. I am a mother. I am a grandmother. I am someone's daughter. I am someone's spouse. I am someone's sister. I stop for <coughs> groceries at your store. I've probably checked you out through my line at my store in Seabrook. You see me every day. I'm everybody behind me. We're not lunatics, we're not radical. We're not looking to go to football games, topless, or libraries, or school meetings, or anywhere else that that would not be proper decorum. But if there is a man in a public space who is obviously comfortable enough 
then why should I not have that same right to exercise the right that I now possess in the state that you want to take away from me? I'm getting off base, I apologize. For those, <clears throat> for those who think breasts are dangerous and lewd, are you having sexual lewd thoughts when you take your shirts off at the beach or the pool in front of your own children and grandchildren? When a man bears his top, that is not a sexual act. We have decided 83 years ago, magically, that all of a sudden, that wasn't sexual anymore. We broke a social norm that was antiquated, archaic, and downright silly, if you ask me. I went to Catholic school. I understand the skirt length rule. I get that. School is one thing. I'm vehemently opposed to dress codes, but that's an entirely different rant. But I do believe you have <coughs> places where those things are important, time and place. But anywhere a man should be legally allowed to bear his top, I should also have that legal right preserved for me as it sits right now in the Constitution. My last concern regards the definition of reasonable person. Who writes this definition? I consider myself fairly reasonable. Again, I am a grandmother, a mother, a sister, a significant other. I have a regular job. I am not a radical or a rabble rouser. I am a woman. I am a resident of the great state of New Hampshire, and I vote. And so do my friends. I am also a firm believer that the nude or topless human form should never be alarming. Shocking, I'm sure. The first days in the 30s, back on the beaches in Atlantic City when men bared their chests, I am quite certain there was some shock. Maybe some discomfort. But alarm? Please. I don't mean to seem disdainful. But at our age, we should not be alarmed by the human form. Thank you for your time. I see no questions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. David Crawford. Thank you. Sorry about that. Here. Barbara McKinney. Is it McKinney? Uh, McKinnon. You're McKinney. very close. Okay. As one of the people who was late, I want to thank you for your time. My apologies so for we're showing fortunately up Fortunately, we're getting down to it. I'll be very quick. All of my points have been covered by other members who oppose this bill. Um, I think the constitutional issue has been expounded upon at length. Um, I would like to touch on, as far as I know, I'm the only person here who is actually qualified to talk about transgender issues, or as Representative Martin put it, gender bending. Um, I feel that. This law opens the door for law enforcement to be placed in a position to determine someone's sex, which they are not qualified to do, nor do they have the tools. It puts law enforcement in the awkward position of potentially requesting information about strangers' genitals during a law enforcement interaction, which can only result in trouble for the state. Um, I feel that there is no clear distinction or definition in what determines whether someone is a woman or a man in social circumstances that is a, in any way um, constant or easy to determine. I think you'll find that people with ambiguous gender are swept up in this. You'll find that feminine men are swept up in this. It opens the door to questions about binary trans people, uh, trans men who have not yet had a mastectomy. Would they be in violation of this law? They are men. Trans men who are post-surgery, would their genitals determine how they're treated under this law? I, I, see no, um, I see no mechanism for how to answer these questions in the law as it's proposed. And as such, I urge you to vote an expedient to pass. Uh, I see no questions. Thank you very much. Question. I want to get your last name. McKinnon? McKinnon. M-A-C-K-I-N-N-O-N. O-N. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, I'm very nervous. I'm so shaky. I can understand that. Kia Sinclair. Kia. 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 
Firstly, we can't overlook the fact that the nipple is used to feed infants and toddlers. So anytime we talk about the female nipple, whether we're talking about it being legal or not, we have to recognize that it's connected. There's already a negative stigma on breastfeeding. And this is because the breast, and specifically the areola nipple, is so hypersexualized and it's criminalized. We're here today talking about criminalizing it, so that proves that. <coughs> Throughout my whole life, I've had plenty of times where I thought, oh man, men are so lucky. I wish I could take my shirt off, it's so hot. But it was the way things were. And I thought it was silly that the nipple itself was always censored, but you could see the rest of the breast. But I never saw it as a case of social injustice until I had my son 19 months ago. And I chose to breastfeed. And it was the first time in my life that I actually had to have my breasts easily accessible. I would never faced a situation in my life where I needed to expose my breasts discreetly and still maintain modesty. So when I would go to breastfeed, I, on one hand, I knew it was natural and normal, but on the other hand, everything I'd been taught about how my breasts being shown in public is indecent. And I struggled with that. When my son was three weeks old, for the first time since he was born, my husband and me and him all went out in public and we went to the bookstore, bam. And by the time we got there, because we lived really far away from everything, my son was hungry. And I figured I'd go inside and I would find a quiet little corner maybe and I could breastfeed him. But when we got in, it was really, really busy. Every single chair, I walked around the whole store, every chair was taken up. Every single corner, there was just people everywhere. And I went and looked in the cafe, and there was people everywhere. There were some chairs available, but no matter what, I would have had to be right out in the open, facing everyone. And at this time, because breastfeeding is a learning curve for both mommy and baby, what I had to do, and I'm going to kind of demonstrate, is I had to hold my son laying down in this arm, and I had to use this hand to shape my breast, and I needed to be able to see what I was doing. And I had to use this hand to bring his head to it. And this was trial and error. Sometimes he wouldn't latch right, and I had to pop him off, put him back on. Sometimes it hurt, and I had to do that again. Or sometimes he just fell off in the middle of feeding. And I chose to go to the bathroom. And I went into the handicap stall, and I sat on the toilet. And at this time, like I said, I wasn't a pro. I actually needed either a breastfeeding pillow or a blanket underneath my arms. And if you can imagine, I was sitting on this toilet that has no armrests, and I'm sitting there trying to shape my breasts and hold my baby, and I gave up, and I ended up sitting right on the floor of the bathroom stall. And people kept walking in, and every time they walked in, they flushed the toilet, and my son basically jumped out of my arms. He started crying, and I started crying. The point of my story is that while I've encountered negative attitudes, and rude comments from other people, and so have other breastfeeding moms, a lot of the fear and the shame was inside me. I was afraid to offend people. I was afraid to let them see my breast. On one hand, I wanted to feed my baby and just sit there like a normal person. But on the other, I didn't want to be indecent. I didn't want to expose myself. And I sit there and I watch men in my life, like my husband, Without a second thought, when he goes to mow our lawn on a hot summer day, he takes his shirt off. He does not fear harassment. He does not think that he will offend somebody. He does not fear that he will be arrested for indecent exposure. But I can't even feed my baby in a busy bookstore without fear and shame and embarrassment. And that is why it needs to change. We shouldn't make the nipple illegal because we reinforce that negative stigma. I don't want my future daughter to ever grow up like that. I want her to feed her baby and never worry that someone would be offended. It shouldn't even be a second thought. If men can expose their nipples, with well, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, I would just um, I just don't know how someone how it can be a law that based on family values, which whose family values, um, and then 
uh, from the point of tourism and the concern that this will cause tourists to flee the state or whatever, I am actually a tourist. So I feel like uh, I could add something on that and the fact that I'm from Massachusetts. I spend lots of time, especially in the summer in New Hampshire. Uh, I love that toplessness is legal here. It's not in Massachusetts for women, unfortunately. And uh, so I spent a lot of time here, especially since learning last summer that toplessness was legal. I came up here so much more. I spent a lot of money staying up here. Um, so I don't necessarily think that it will affect tourism as much as some might think, because for every person that's like, oh, I'm not going to bring my family to the beach, there might be topless people. I think there's going to be people that might go to New Hampshire just because it's a freer state than some other places. I know a lot of people from Massachusetts that have gone up with me because of those reasons. Um, and again, on the money front, um, since I know that's an issue with it, uh, it was said, um, on the paper with the um, proposed bill that it wouldn't end up costing the state money, but um, I happen to know that I and most of my friends are not going to probably stop this anytime soon. Um, so we will keep fighting, and if you pass the bill, uh, that's not the end of it. We're not going to just say, okay, well, I guess we'll keep our tops on and, you know, go home. So uh, just think carefully, because it's not about, it's not going to change it, whether you pass it or not. It's just simply not going to change whether people are going to do it. I think that this is something that's been a long time coming. Men got the right about 100 years ago. It's just a matter of time before we do. And you want to be, um, New Hampshire could be one of the first states that you could be, you could set a precedent for this movement. You could be like, you know, this could be the start of something. And uh, I think you could look back and realize that this is where we stopped you know, claiming women so much, and we started really equalizing things and upholding equality in the Constitution. So, um, yeah, well, I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just for the record, that, could you clarify the spelling of your last name? D R U M H E L L E R. Thank you. That's the M I missed. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further questions, well, thank, thank, you. Mr. Thank, you. Mr. thank you, Mr. Chairman. In Massachusetts, how does the law go? Uh, it's kind of vague. No one really knows. Um, but it's, uh, I know you could get arrested or cited or something in public, um, minus a few. Uh, there's a small, like, sun area in my town. But other than that, uh, it's not allowed. Fine. Yeah, there's fine. Things. Thank you very much. I have one for the three cards. Um, we have people signed in in favor and against. Um, Representative Marty, I can't read the last name. Marty Chapman. J-A-C-K from Nashville. Yeah, he is against it. Um, I'm not going to read the people that have already testified. Uh, Bonnie Davis, James Davis, our pro, uh, Karen... Looks like Sackler is pro. Uh, yeah. Frederick is, is opposed. Um, some of these, I, I hate to say I mispronounce the names terribly. What would you Right here. Something like that. Uh, David Crawford's opposed. Dylan Gordon's opposed. And that's all the people that have signed in that haven't testified. I was going to offer a definition of Massachusetts indecent exposure statute. Uh, uh, you our, can research our, yourself, but our uh, researcher can get that very easily. Very good. Okay. So I'm going to close the hearing on House Bill uh, 1525. Uh, we are recessed until 1 o'clock.